Would you turn to Luke 1, verse 46 through 56? Luke chapter 1. If you have a Bible, uh, are we going to have a display on the, on the screen? Zachary's going to do it for us. You know, a lot of people, when they look at this passage, you immediately assume that Mary is speaking from a very prophetic anointing. Somehow, because she's, you know, have this conception, this miraculous conception in her womb, the baby Jesus, and her spirituality, spirituality just immediately elevated into a prophetic song, all right? And that's how a lot of people interpret this passage. But I, I feel in the life of Mary, in this stage of her life, she's yet to understand the prophetic significance of Jesus in her womb. I don't think she understands the full revelation of how Jesus is going to be the Messiah and that the salvation plan is to be fulfilled in the life of this unborn baby. Okay? So that's why we, every time we see Jesus, uh, Mary having an encounter with any kind of prophetic words that enter into her life, for example, angels appear to her in the dream and so forth, and words that are spoken about Jesus, and she just meditate on those things because she didn't really understand them. She, she has something. Have you ever been in that situation where, where words are spoken to you, you believe in the validity and the truth behind those words, but you just don't know what they really mean yet because it has not yet been fully realized in your life? Okay? Yes, that, that's what's going on with Mary's life. And, and Mary is such a, such a very, uh, you know, I, I think she's wise in the sense that she treated without haste. She doesn't jump right into it and say, okay, this is what it means, and maybe this is how it is, is to be revealed. Mary just takes it, and she puts it in her heart, in her mind, and she meditates on them. She meditates. And that's something, that's something we need to learn to do, is, is when, when we're given some prophetic words, or when we're giving some vision about our lives, uh, it, it would be wise for us to treat it with, uh, without haste. Just takes some time and caution, and, and just allow these words to, to become true. Allow these words to be fully realized in our lives. Okay, so, so I'm going to be looking at Mary's song, the, the song that she began to utter when she was in Elizabeth's house. house. And uh, from the perspective of, of someone who's a, who's a mother and, and she's just been given this blessing of a child in her womb. Okay, from the pers perspective of inception. Um, so let's uh, look at this passage. And I want to give us a quick context before we start looking at this passage. Because we all know that Mary, at this time, she's only a teenager. She's probably a young girl, young girl, unwed mother. Okay? Just think about that. She has not been married, and she is pregnant with a child, and what we call a teenage pregnant young lady. Now, how would you look at this young lady in our society today? Hello? Bad. We, we, uh, there'll be a lot of judgment. How does the church typically look at someone who's not married but pregnant. There's a lot of condemnation. They consider them a sinner sometimes. We don't definitely not welcome them like we're supposed to most, peop most places because we don't want their influence. Right? Come on. Be honest. <laughs> right? In the olden days. In the olden days. <laughs> okay. How, how do you look at a, a teenage pregnant Compassion, pardon me, pity, okay. Just imagine 2,000 years ago, all right, people are more conservative and they're, they're very traditional in their beliefs. Or it, it, church today, I, I would think, are, are still very traditional for the most part, but there are other churches that, that are more open to, to loving and being more compassionate. Two are these teenage pregnant 
Girls? What is it? Okay. All right, so we're seeing this young lady who's pledged to be married to Joseph. She had a vision for her life. She is not someone without a vision. And halfway through this journey, she experienced something that's out of herself. Okay? Something miraculous happened. It's not something she prayed for. It's not something she expected ordinarily would happen to someone like her. All right? Now think about yourself for a moment. You know, every one of us got some plan or plans for our lives. We, 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 we do. I mean, we, some of us do. <laughs> we have some plans. We have some idea what to expect. We all do. You know, even if you're in school, you expect you're, you're in a fourth grader, you expect to be fifth grade next year, right? You expect to finish elementary school before you go to junior high. But if you're, you know, just college graduate, you expect to go to the workplace. I mean, there's certain expectation for life. But then something happened, and something interrupted your life. Okay, because having a child for a woman can be an interruption. Amen? It can be an interruption. And so here is this woman who's interrupted. And, uh, and this is the song she sang in Elizabeth's house. Verse 46 and 47, can we read it together? 46, go to 46, please. All the way, scroll all the way down. One more time, there we go, 46. And Mary said, can we uh, read it together? And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. One more, one more time. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. See, when things like this happen to a woman, okay, what do you, what do you suppose this, uh, this person will respond? How, how would this person respond? What do you suppose this person would do? When something like this happens, okay, she may be angry, she may be worried, she may be afraid, okay? I mean, these emotions are normal for a young lady who is not an adult yet, and who's not married, and now she's pregnant with all the judgmental eyes looking on her, and she probably have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. She may be afraid of losing her own life and maybe the child inside her. She has a lot of things that she could be worried about, concerned about for tomorrow. Okay? This is a woman. But do, what do you see right here? You see that she says, My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. You know, w women sometimes th think of, think of uh, child rearing as a woman's right in comparison to the men, right? Men, we do not have this right. <laughs> we, okay? There, there's no way for us to be a mom. Come on, amen? Come on, guys. Amen. But, but you know, it's women, some, some women consider a, a privilege, that this is the right to be a, a mom. But then, do you realize that... Uh, not everybody feel that way. When it happens, they are traumatized by what happens when they have a child because they had it, had a plan. And then somehow this happened and it interrupts whatever plan you had. You know, you may have a career and all of a sudden you're pregnant. Then what happens? It, it, it stops everything. You may be in school, and halfway through your schooling, you have to drop out. That has it happened to people? Yeah, it happened to Helen. Helen <laughs> happened to Helen, right? She was in school and she had to drop out of school. I mean, that happens. She was married at the time, yes. 
What if it didn't happen that way? What if it happened while she's, you know, she's not married yet? A lot of interruptions. You know, this young lady who's barely maybe 15, 16 years old, we don't know how, she, how old she is. She has such a traumatic experience in her life, and yet she has so much faith. Do you see this? She sees this as something she glorifies God. Her soul, her spirit rejoices in God, her Savior. How do you, how do you turn, you know, how, how do you turn a teenager in some, into something like this, to, into someone like this? This is amazing. This is amazing spirit inside her that, that she's able to rejoice overlooking all the potential possible just problems that she be, could be facing. Okay? It's an incredible amount of stress, amount of pressure that could happen uh, in that person's life. And yet, she rejoices in the Lord. Isn't that amazing? See, this is her perspective. She, she sees it as a privilege, not as an interruption. Now, I, I know there's a lot of uh, women who, who may have children already. And, and some people may want to have children, but they're not, they don't have children yet. But they, they see, the, see what happens to them as an interruption to what they were, what they were doing, where they were going. And that changes their heart. So what do you see this as? Is it a privilege or an interruption? All right, and we're going to learn from little Mary here. Uh, reading, let's reading, uh, read from verse 48 through 49 together. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. For now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Now, how do we find ourselves in the blessing of God? Zachary, how do we find ourselves in the blessing of God? Not Jeremy, sorry. Am I losing my mind? <laughs> Jeremy, Jeremy. How do we find ourselves in the blessing of God? <laughs> how do you do that? This passage teaches us that for us to be in God's blessing, we need to be obedient. We need to be obedient. And for us to be obedient, we need to be humble. Do you see right here? For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. He's referring to herself as a servant of God. A servant is someone who is obedient, and a servant is someone who is humble in light of God's authority. So she finds herself a humble servant of God. And she, at this stage of her life, submit to the authority. As a young teenager, submit to the authority of God. Now, why would a person... Man, I'm, I am not feeling well. You can tell? <laughs> Maybe my sugar is low, but it's okay. It's okay. I can't even think. <laughs> All right. This is going to be an interesting service, guys. It's going to partly treat a uh, diabetic on Sunday morning as we listen to a message. All right. Thank you. Just, just, just cookies. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you might as well take a whole bag. No, 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 I'll just take one bite. Hmm. Hmm. Take a minute uh, to pray for each other right now. Just pray for the person next to you. Okay. Let's take a break. Pray for them. Father God, we just ask for your presence even more right now, Lord. In the middle service, we, it's not about the service, it's about you, Father God. I look better after a little bit of sugar. All right. All right. How, how do you find this woman? How do you find this woman who, who's got a 
this baby inside her that's going to change her life, no matter which way. All right? It, it, it could happen that she could be stoned to death. It's possible, right? And, and she, Joseph could divorce her before they even get married. All right? Even though they're pledged to be married, he could say, forget you. I'm getting another woman. All right? All these things could be happening, yet this woman at this stage, she is giving glory to God, giving thanks to God for her condition. Now, because most people don't realize this, a woman who is pregnant is going through a lot. Is going through a lot in her heart, in her mind. She has to be prepared. She said, am I ready to be a mom? Can I do a good job? There's a lot of self-doubt. There's a lot of, a lot of questions unanswered because it's not like when you're married, you, you get, you know, you're conceiving, you, you have a child inside you, and you get an owner's manual. Right? You read up and say, all right, these are the steps, how to be a mom. Come on. Somebody say amen. You, you, don't, you don't know. You just really don't know. And, and there's a lot, of, a lot of doubt that is taking place. And this woman... Who, who has to confront all these potential problems in her life and a major interruption in her dreams and goals, all right? How could she find herself to be a blessing? How? How can you find yourself to be a blessing? Because you could easily be bitter about what happened to you. You could easily start cursing the child inside you. It could easily say, God, why now? Why me? But she was obedient because she was humbled. She says, God, I trust in you. The question I want to ask you this morning is, every mom here, you have a child, all right, grown up or not, you look at your child, I want you to ask yourself, if you want to be a mom, if you want to be a mom, could you make that decision to be a mom apart from God? Apart from God, can you make a decision and say, I want to be a mom, and then you become a mom? Some people take that as a right to a woman and say, I am a woman, therefore, I get to be a mom, right? You can't say that apart from the will of God. Just because you want to have a child doesn't mean you naturally get a child. Do you, know, do you understand that? And who do you get? A girl or a boy? Do you make that decision? No. What kind of child do you get? The com compliant, the strong-willed? Do you get to decide? No. This whole experience of conception, this whole experience of, of motherhood is up to, up to God. So how can you find yourself to be a blessing? How do you find yourself in a blessing of the sovereign? Unless you are humbled and obedient. Right? You see that? So this woman... This young lady uh, realized that it's not up to her to be a mother. And, uh, and that God gets to decide. And that she has to humble herself and submit. Submit to the sovereignty of God. For her to be part of God's blessing. See, there's a lot of people raising children has not been a blessing. For a lot of people, having children may not be a blessing for everyone unless you submit to God, to the sovereignty of God. What else do we see here? We also see that here, she emphasized, and I, we're going to talk about a little more about this later on as well, is that she says, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. All generations. She also sees what God is doing in the unborn child and that this child is going to be a blessing for generations. Can you see that? Can you see 
that your baby, even though this baby is not born yet, or maybe your baby is grown up a bit, and that this child is going to be a blessing, not only for you, but for other people. Now, of course, we're talking about Jesus here. Jesus is, is definitely the blessing for all generations. But is it possible, just that, just slightly possible, that your child could be a blessing for another man, for another woman, for a whole family, maybe a company, a nation? Is it possible? How does she see that? She had a vision that was passed on somehow in faith that God grant her this vision that she was able to see past generations. Generational, generational blessing. Somehow God was able to allow her to see that. Every conception is a blessing to the generations. That takes a lot of faith. See, most people only look at their own circumstance, their own condition, and say, you know what, I may be in a pretty bad situation right now. All right? And they look at their child as a, an appendage or a, an addition to their circumstance. But this woman, a young teenager, sees herself as becoming blessing for generations. Generations are going to call her blessed. Isn't that amazing? Amazing. And say, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. All right. So let's move on to the next, uh, next verse, verse 50. And what we're going to see is kind of like unpacking what that really means. Okay. She's, she's going to talk about verse 50 says, His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. One more time. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. See, God's mercy is for those who fear God. And this benefit is passed on from generation to generation. And I am looking at Mary. And Mary is thinking about something about her past, about their history as, as Israel, as a, as a Jew. All right? What kind of generations are we talking about? We're talking about the generation of faith that was passed on. You know, well, what's the point of studying, you know, Abraham, uh, Isaac, and what's Isaac's son? Jacob, and, and so forth, right? I mean, all this genealogy, what is the point of reminding us of genealogy? Is to remind us life pass on to life. Okay? This is a very simple principle about life, is that life passes on to life, through life. Why do we have children? Generational life is being passed on. What's so good about studying Abraham? He's not a perfect man, even though he's called the faith, father of faith. We recognize that. What's wrong with Abraham? I love to pick at the faults of these people. Faithful men of God, I, I love to pick at their faults. Why? Because the Bible makes it very plain to us that Abraham was not a perfect man. Abraham had problems. What kind of problem? Give me a couple examples of his problems. Come on. He lied twice, okay? Wives. He had lied twice about his wife. Okay? Not just once. He says, this is my sister. He lied twice. How many of you lied before, ever, in your life? Okay. Thank God. Thank God you guys are honest about that. Some of you are, are, are lying right now. <laughs> thank God. I, I thank God every time I find flaws in the biblical characters. Because it reminds me that I too can be a man of faith. Even though I am not perfect. We all know our, our own imperfections, right? Amen? We all recognize it. And yet, we can be considered a man of faith. But yet, faith is passed on from generation to generation imperfectly. Just because you're imperfect, your child is imperfect, God can still bless the generations. Amen? You believe in that? 
It, it takes a lot of faith to believe somehow my imperfect faith can go pass on to the next generation and still be imperfect and that's still good enough for God. Do you see that? Generation to generation. Faith. And that's God's mercy. Do you see that? God is merciful in that none of us are perfect. We pass on to a generation of imperfect people. And that's God's mercy. That's God's mercy. I mean, a lot of us perfectionists. Why? Because we, we have this sense of guilt that for us not to be perfect ourselves. And so we expect and demand more from our children. Expecting them to be perfect. And guess what happens? Huh? Guess what happened? That same curse passes on. Okay? Because you expect your children to be perfect, and they expect their children to be perfect. Every generation suffers from that, that mist, that, that, that big gap of expectation and reality. And how do we fill that gap? How do we fill that that big vacuum from expectation and reality, God's mercy. My God's mercy. If we don't have the mercy of God, we cannot understand why our children are like this way. We raise them to be better than this. Some people say that, right? Come on, you heard that before. I raise them up to be better than this. The truth is, you're not perfect. And you should not be expecting them to be perfect. Generation to generation, anyone who fears the Lord, God have mercy on them. Anyone who fears the Lord. What is the requirement to, to fear God? It's a disposition of the heart. I regard you, God, as my Lord. You are my God. I fear you. I, I honor you. I obey you. I give you glory. You know, that kind of life, God gives mercy God gives mercy okay I think I need more sugar anybody want some chocolate no yeah I got some chocolate right here this is great <laughs> on Sunday morning I get to chew chocolate <laughs> while you guys are there watching me she continues in verse 51. Can somebody read it for me? Really loud. One more time. So she's reminded about the, the genealogies that these Jews pass on faith from generation to generation and she's also reminded of God who performed mighty deeds with his arms perhaps things that took place in Egypt and perhaps also she's reminded of a great event in their history called the Tower of Babel anybody remember Tower of Babel the Tower of Babel is where people gather together people gather together all people gather together and they want to, make, want to make a name for themselves. All right? Is it good to have people gather together? I, I, I want to challenge you. Gathering people together may not be a good thing sometimes. Just gathering people together, a lot of times we gossip. A lot of times we criticize each other. A lot of times we look down on each other. Just gathering people together may not be a good thing. You know, sometimes some churches, when we gather, it does not serve the body at all. When we don't have compassion, looking at each other with love and just equality, we, we judge and we, we criticize, we look down on people and so forth. That's really, really bad. But when we gather together to join the love of God and sharing His grace, it is a wonderful thing. But in this circumstance, when the people gathered together to create this Tower of Babel, what were they doing? They were exalting men. Do you know what I'm talking about? When people come together, sometimes we, we want people like, Hey, Thomas, come on, support me here, all right? 
I need to be elevated a little bit, okay? So you say a few good things about me, so I get to be elevated, and maybe, maybe Charlie can do the same thing. A few of us can be elevated, and guess what? Next week, I'm going to support you, Thomas, all right? So, so everybody kind of support each other, and then we elevate us. That's what we do in our society, isn't it? That's what we do in people. People do this to each other. We support each other. We elevate one another. We exalt men. We exalt men. What do you think God is in the business of doing? God is in the business of saving souls. But here the Bible tells us, He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. God is in the business of destroying men's pride. God is in the business of destroying men's pride. In, in the context of a mother who's having a child, think about this. What kind of pride passes on? What kind of pride passes on? You know, a lot of moms and dads, they, they, they really want to, want to see the best part of themselves pass on to the next generation. Amen? Isn't that true? Yeah. Say, well, I'm really good at math. I want to see my children very good at math. I'm a good engineer. I want my children to be very good in engineering. I'm really good at music. I want my children to be good at music. Come on. Isn't that true? And that's what's going on in, in generations. A lot of times we gather people together. We exalt ourselves. A lot of times we look to the next generation, expect them to surpass themselves. I want to see my son better than me. I want to see my daughter greater than me. Is there a problem with that? God is in the, God is in the business of destroying human pride. I can tell you right now, a lot of parents are learning this lesson of humility in their next generation. You know, in their next generation. They work so hard, preparing their child to be better than them. But you know what? It's not going to happen. Sometimes it happens, but most of the time it doesn't. And if it does happen, actually it ends in tragedy. It ends in tragedy. Oh, because I'm really good at math and my wife is really good at math and I expect my, my son to be a math genius. And it turns out he's worse than math. That's his worst subject. He doesn't like math at all. And he likes to sing. That's what happens. God is in the business of destroying our pride. And when we start looking at our children as someone who is going to surpass us so that they can carry the family name. You know, we're all in the business of remembering our own name, remembering ourselves. But God is in the business of destroying pride. He doesn't want us to do that. Who decides how this child is going to be brought up? Who gets to decide that? We let God decide. We let God decide. Don't create for yourself this kind of uh, generational pride that you pass on from generation to generation and hoping that somehow they're going to be better than you. And I can tell you, you will be sorely disappointed. I read this in my mom's posting on Facebook. My mom posts a lot of things on Facebook, by the way. And uh, there's a story of this woman. Uh, at 21, she committed a suicide. On Mother's Day, my mom shared this on Facebook. Okay? This woman committed suicide at 21 years old. Because all her life, her parents were very well educated, and had very good position, good jobs in, 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 in China. And, uh, and, and that, because of that, they have very high expectation for their children. So through elementary school, this child struggled, but then somehow the parents worked hard, pushed, 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 more tutoring and so forth. Finally, this child becomes successful. But the next time, the next level, there's more challenge. She fails, and then once again, the parents push, 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 finally, finally this child succeeds, and then went to work, finally, and got this wonderful job, and she wants to quit this job because she failed once again. And then the parents push her back and does not give her any room for failure 
And finally, at 21 years old, this woman commits suicide. I don't know if it's a true story. Uh, the, way they re the way they wrote the article looked like it was a true story. It even had the name of the person in it. And this mom, who, uh, who contributed to the article, uh, wanted to warn all the other parents because of her own failure as a mom. It's because the pride of a person, the pride of a man, can destroy lives. How do you find yourself to be a blessing when you humble yourself and be obedient? Because God wants to use you and your next generation to be a blessing. And how can blessing come forth unless you let go? See, some of the most insecure people have the most insecure parents. Are you with me? Okay? Some of the most, so, you know, the, the insecure because they, they don't feel confident and they have to make sure everything is perfect. You know, some of the perfectionists that we have today among us because they have perfectionists as parents. They expect them to be perfect. And do you know how, what kind of stress we have to go through? Do you know what kind of stress these, these children have to go through? And what God wants us to do is destroy our pride. Do you know the success rate of transgenerational businesses based on the statistics? You know? Very, very slim. Okay? Parents work hard and created a business and they want their children to take over, most likely. Flat. Most of the time. Don't do that. Who decide the future of this child? Who? God. It's God. So don't create a child so that you can be proud of. Let them be proud of God. Let God be proud of this child. And then uh, verse 52 and 53 says, let's read it. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. Yep. Think about that for a second. Think about that. What do you think she's saying? Not only is God in control of my life, but God is in control of kingdoms. God is in control of kingdoms. What a perspective from a little teenage woman. She sees how kings are in God's hands. Whether you're rich or poor, you're in God's hands. Doesn't matter what position you are, what position you hold. You're in God's hand. It's the same God who rules the kingdoms. And uh, last part. Verse 54 and 55. Let's read it together. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. You see, God helped Israel because... God remembered his promise to Abraham. And what she is saying is that I am also part of that promise. All right? Now, how many of you ever heard a promise from God? At least you feel that this is what God told you in your heart. Yes, you believe that. All right? Our God never forgets. I want to remind you, I want to remind you our God is not a God who is forgetful. He made a promise to you, and he's going to fulfill it. He's a fulfiller of promises. Amen? All right, I want you to tell the person next to you in, the, in a small voice, God does not forget. You may forget, but I, God will not forget. See, we may forget that God made a promise to us, but God will not forget. Because he is a fulfiller of his own promise. He, he does not go back on his words. You know, sometimes as moms, dads, we receive words, confirmation from the Lord. This is from God. I'm going to hold on to it. You know what, my friends? Hold on to it. 
might be fulfilled in five years, ten years, twenty years. You know, some moms, they pray for their sons, pray for ten years, twenty years, thirty years, never seen fulfillment. But I want to tell you right now, if it came from the Lord, He is going to fulfill it. Amen? See right here, this woman, little girl, she has a perspective about her own life. First, she surrenders and says, whatever you will, God, I am going to submit myself to that. That is a wonderful perspective. And, and she has this perspective about generations. That faith is passed on from generation to generation and is imperfect. No matter how imperfect we are, God's mercy is greater. And that's how we're, we're confident in God, not because our, of our failures, but we're confident in God because His mercy passed from generation to generation. You need, genera you need mercy just like your next generation needs mercy. I said mom or her dad. And he, she also has a perspective that no matter what position you're in, all the kingdoms, all the kingdoms are in God's hands. The poor. James, think about it. The poor. God's taking care of them. No matter what country. The Philippines. China. Brazil. Africa. God is faithful there. He is merciful. What God promised to Abraham is being revealed in Israel. And it's being revealed in our very lives. This is the, the only passage, I, I, I think, only part of this prayer, I feel it's, it's a fulfillment of the prophetic, of the messianic promise. And that messianic promise can also be, can, can also be fulfilled in us, that we, too, are a blessing to the nations. Do you believe that? We, too, are a blessing to the nations. Tell the person next to you and say, you are a blessing to the nations. Of course, you're a blessing to me first, right? <laughs> Before it becomes a nation. So we are a blessing to each other. We're a blessing. Children are a blessing from the Lord. Amen? Amen? Yes. Our parents are a blessing from the Lord too, right? Y'all believe in that? Come on. Children say amen. Yeah, they don't say amen. So parents are a blessing from the Lord. Children are a blessing from the Lord. Parents are also a blessing from the Lord. But ultimately, through all these blessings that we find, God is the one who orchestrated the relationship, orchestrated everything. So, I want, to, want us to look at the last verse, verse 56. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. What do you think happened in these last three months? Come on. What do you think happened? They share, they fellowshiped. They spend time together. They pray together. There were times when Mary was really, really down. And Elizabeth just encouraged her. There was time when Mary had some doubts. Elizabeth encouraged her. And there were times when Mary was really joyful and she was filled with the Spirit. She blessed over Elizabeth. And that's the kind of relationship we have. Even though uh, our future are not in our hands. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But the fellowship is beautiful. It's great to have this wonderful relationship in the body. We have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. There's a lot of uncertainties in, in our future. But we learn to just submit ourselves, to be obedient, humble ourselves, allow God to work through His mercy in our lives and the generation that we, we don't even see sometimes. We don't even see what's going to happen next generation. But we realize that all this is a history of faith that's connected all the way back to our own, our Heavenly Father. You don't, we don't, we can't make sense of it sometimes. But we can see it is by mercy of God. All these things are connected. And we live by faith each day. And we fellowship with one another like Elizabeth fellowship with Mary. And for three months... They encouraged each other, and it was a beautiful thing. And maybe once in a while, they'll play pillow fight. Right? 
Could you imagine? Because they're, she was a teenager. So she could be running in the mud, you know? They could be having fun together. And that's how the fellowship of the church can be. We grow together. Amen? Let's pray. Uh, <clears throat>